understanding some aspects of linear regression. That's what we're doing this week. Um, and last time we talked about linear regression with one variable. Now we're going to look at linear regression with multiple variables, which becomes a lot more complicated. Um, but we're going to start with this discussion. How do you understand if an effect is significant? Option one, look at the R squared value. Option two, look at the confidence interval. And what did people say? Let's take a look. Reveal counts. 10 people said, look at the confidence interval out of 10 people. I guess I, I must have said it wrong, so you could do both. So uh, 10 people said, look at the confidence interval. Three people said both, I guess. Um, and the correct answer is to look at the confidence interval. So you guys are understanding that quite well. Oh, I also, I guess, didn't put in the right answer. All right, well, the correct answer is look at the confidence interval. The R squared value uh, is kind of an, a measurement of the total absolute error, right? The, it's like the mean squared error. And it's exactly the ratio of the mean squared error of your model to the mean squared error of a straight line estimator. And unfortunately, the R squared error, it can be low for different reasons or it can be high for different reasons. And one reason is if there's high irreducible error, then your R squared will never be a low value. Uh, and so the R squared error on its own is like looking, it, it's really like just looking at the training error is not going to help you figure out if something is significant or not. The actual definition of significant is does the confidence interval include zero or not. If it includes zero, then you say, oh, well, maybe this just happened by chance. If it doesn't include zero, then you say it's significant. It's unlikely to happen by chance. That's a quick summary from the last 10 minutes of last class. All right. Any questions or comments about confidence intervals? We're going to move on to multiple linear regressions, unless there's any questions. OK, so let's do one with multiple linear regression. Exercise one. Multiple linear regressions when the x's are correlated. So if, if the x's were all independent, then multiple linear regression would not be so complicated. But in real life, they're often always very, very correlated. They're really related to each other. And so the uh, example I gave you is this. We have an x1 and an x2. And the x1 and then the x2 are correlated along this axis. So as x1 increases, x2 is also likely to increase. And I have a question about a particular regression. So we have a system with three effects, x1 and x2 and y. We're thinking of x1 and x2 as inputs and y as the output. But of course, you could think of it uh, in many other ways. And we run a regression of the form y equals beta 1 hat x1. So we do a regression with y and beta just with the x1. And the question is, let's interpret this coefficient beta 1 hat. Which of these describes the interpretation of beta 1 hat the best? And there are two options that correspond to the two arrows that are on the screen. And here are the two options. When x1 increases by one unit, allowing the other variables to change accordingly, that's like the blue value, the blue arrow, then the value of y increases by beta 1 hat units on average. So it's saying beta 1 hat means if you start here and you go there, then the y value has increased by beta 1 hat units. That's the option blue arrow. Increase x1 while also allowing x2 to vary. And so because they're correlated, when you increase x1, the x2s tend to increase on average. We're letting them both increase and seeing how y changes. That's option one. Option two, when x1 increases by y unit and the other variables are held fixed, that's the red arrow, then the value of y increases by beta 1 hat units on average. So that is, you, you increase, we're increasing only x1. We leave x2 constant and we increase only x1. And beta 1 hat tells you how much y increases when you move from this point to that point. Those are the two options. You can either vote for the blue arrow or the red arrow. Any questions or comments about the question? OK, I'll set you guys free for like three minutes. Think about it. Uh, let's do the first round. Let's, do, let's, let's take like two minutes, do it on your own. And then we'll probably have a second round where you can talk to people. Um, so do your gut instinct if you watch those videos carefully uh, that you were supposed to watch today. Uh, this was mentioned, and you will maybe remember how to do it. But I'll give you two minutes to do it on your own, and then we'll do it as a group after, if needed.
Okay, 30 seconds left. About one third of people have an answer. If you don't know for sure, time to start thinking, how are you going to guess? Okay, 10 seconds left, put in your guesses. This is your chance to guess. There's five people who haven't answered yet. Okay, let's see what people said. Reveal counts. 10 to eight. Pretty even splits. Out of 18 people, 10 people think it's the red arrow. Eight people think it's the blue arrow. This is very close to 50-50. So I'm going to let you guys revote. Feel free to discuss now why you think it is what it is and see if you can use your neighbor's intuition to help you figure out which one it is. One of these is absolutely right and the other one is absolutely wrong. It's not a, a gray area where it could be either. It's exactly one thing and I can show you, we're going to do a little a notebook where it's going to show you which one's the right answer, but see if you can figure it out. So I'll give you guys three minutes to discuss and we'll revote. Okay, 10 seconds left. Put in your final guesses. It's open again. You have to revote. Even if you didn't change your answer, you must put in the same answer again. And we'll see what people said. Okay, 16 people. Put in your last things while I guess over here. 18. Okay, and we don't want the timer to go up again. Okay. Let's take a look. What did people change to? 12 to 8. So people are more on the red arrow and less on the blue arrow. Does anybody want to tell me why they think either one is true? It's still pretty evenly split, 8 to 12. Anyone want to say why they think it's either one? Yeah. Uh, I think because uh, just the uh, you know, variable is one uh -huh. in the equation. Uh -huh. And uh, we suppose that uh, we have just one variable. 
Okay, fantastic. Okay, so let's put the blackboard here and let me write down what you said. So the question is, let me draw a cartoon of the problem. We have a bunch of points and they're correlated like this. The blue arrow goes this way and the red arrow goes this way. Okay, I guess it's a orangey red over here. And the reason it's red, Y red. So I think you said in the model we have Y equals beta hat one x and x one. And so if x one goes to x one plus one, like if you add one to the value x one, then y equals beta hat one times x one plus one, which is beta hat one x one plus beta hat one. So you add one only to x one, that's the same as adding beta hat one to y, you're increasing by uh, beta hat one, you only moved in the red direction. So this is red direction. Okay, very good, very good argument. Anybody for blue? Anybody wanna say why blue? Blue, the blue people are nervous. Okay, maybe this will help the blue people. The blue people, let me help the blue people have some confidence. The blue arrow is correct. The red arrow is wrong. So if you're on team blue, now will you say why you thought blue? Yes. So my intuition was that uh, because the equation you already solved for you in the red, the beta one, x one, b plus beta one, that is basically equation ah, of Wait, wait, one. sorry. Beta one, x one. What is this one? Uh, that uh, equation. This, this equation, the same one I had over here? Yeah, yeah. This one, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the line equation, the beta one, x one, hat x one plus beta one. Uh, that is equivalent to mx plus c, the equation of a line. Uh -huh. And each and every line has some kind of slope. So uh -huh. it can't be just flat. I mean, slope can't be zero. If it is zero, then what is the meaning of a regression? So I think uh -huh. that it will be blue line. Ah, uh, I see. Okay. So you're saying this, the slope of this line is zero. This is what you were saying. The slope of the red line is zero. The slope of red line is zero. Yeah, and we, right. we are saying is mean of the prediction. I see. Okay, this is a great. Okay, a zero. fantastic comment. Let Let's uh, clarify something here. So, the, uh, let me can I hide uh, the results so I get a little bit more real estate back. Uh, maybe if I zoom out, zoom in. No. Okay. Okay. Well, zoom out. So, in this plot, there's actually three variables, right? There's x1, x2, and y. There's x1 and x2, but y is the color of the points. So th this red line, you're right, the slope of x1 with respect to x2 is zero. So this is the red line is saying increase x1 by one, increase x2 by zero. So the slope of how x1 is changing as x2 changes, that slope is zero. But you can sort of imagine if the, uh, instead of being a color, if they were coming out of the board, right? If they were like the height of the y pieces, that there would be a positive slope in how the y's are changing. And that is like more like what we're talking about here because we're talking about y equals some constant times x1. So we're talking about the x1 y slope. So the something is zero, but that's the x1 x2 slope, not the x1 y slope. Uh, so yeah, that's a good thing to clarify. Um, good, great comment though. Okay, uh, anyone else want to say? Yeah. Because the slope of x1 is dependent on the slope. The slope of x1 is dependent on the slope of x2. What do you mean by that? What, what, is, the what is the slope of x2 here? x1 and x2 are correlated. x1 and x2 are correlated. Yes, I agree. That was the premise of the problem. So how does that enter into what the value of beta hat 1 represents? It's true. It's got something to do with correlated, right? Of course, if, if they were not correlated, if they were not correlated, then the red and the blue would be in the exact same direction, right? And then both answers would be right. But because they are correlated, why is that causing this issue? Anyone else want to take a 
uh, a stab at it. It's, it's okay to brainstorm. This, this, this puzzles almost every, almost everybody gets this wrong. This is a really like common misconception about how linear regression works, and that's why we're going over it now. So it's okay to say something that isn't quite right, and we're trying to get to a good intuitive way to understand what's going on here. Okay, let me, let me show you a little thing to convince you that it really is the blue one and not the red one. And what I've done is I have, this is the computer program that generated this thing. If I can open it, uh, where did it put it? Computer. Give it back, oh, I'll put it over here, okay. Uh, so this is what we want. Can I do this? Okay, so, uh, and again, this is in the course GitHub. This is the plot that made it. And uh, down here, I have the true values. So in real life, you just get the, the data, you can look at it like this, you have a bunch of samples. But because I made it, I have the secret information on how it was made, right? I can tell you, I can peek behind the curtain and see how it was made. And that information is written here. That information is written here. So the true setup, which is secret, and in real life you never ever actually see, is written here. Let me kind of make it a little bit bigger. Uh, in real life, there is a real value beta 1, and there's a real value beta 2. And y is beta 1 times x1 plus beta 2 times x2, plus some noise, which is the irreducible noise that is independent of everything. And beta 1 is 3, and beta 2 is 4. So the real model, the real model, in true, the true model, the true model is y equals beta 1 with no hat times x1 plus beta 2 times x2 plus epsilon is the irreducible noise. And beta 1 and beta 2 have no hats because they are the real, actual thing that we want to measure. Uh, and in, in real life, okay, in this particular case, it was linear. In real life, if it's not, even if it's nonlinear, there is a best possible beta 1 and beta 2. So you can always write an equation like this that includes everything that is the best possible beta 1 and beta 2. In real life, you will never know the actual value of beta 1 and beta 2. You can only estimate them and get beta 1 hat, beta 2 hat. Um, and, but in this case, we do know what they are. In the example, they were 3 and 4. So beta 1 was 3, and beta 2 was 4. That was the example. OK. So beta 1 was 3, and beta 2 was 4. And then I said, OK, let me do a linear regression. So I did a really simple linear regression uh, using the NumPy version of linear regression, which is the simplest possible version. NumPy linal is linear algebra. LSTSQ is least squares. That's the same thing as linear regression. And I just took x1 and y. So I made this model, which is the model we were talking about. It's y equals beta 1 hat. Beta 1 hat, beta hat 1 times x1. And it came out with the answer, which was beta hat equals 6. Beta 1 hat equals 6. So the estimated model, the estimated model, that is, I guess it shouldn't be in quotes. It really is an estimated model. Okay. Um, y equals beta 1 half x1 and beta 1 half beta 1 half was 6. Okay, it was actually 6.03 or something. Let's put 6.02. So beta 1 half was like 6, even though beta 1 was 3 and beta 2 was 4. So what, what is going on here? I thought we were supposed to get 3. Why did we get 6? Well, the answer is also hidden in here which is that the correlation between x1 and x2 is 0 0.75. The correlation between x1 and x2 is 0 0.75. So the correlation between x1 and x2 is 0 0.75. So why am I getting 6? 6 is equal to the, the real beta 1, 3, plus 0.75 times 4, 3 quarters of the beta 2. And so what is happening when you do this regression, it really is that you're going in the direction of the blue arrow you're really going in the direction of the blue arrow, just like I claimed. And when you go in the blue arrow, two things happen. So you go in the blue arrow, when you go increase by 1 in the x1 direction, the y's go up by 3. They go up by the, beta, the true beta 1. And then you've also gone up a little bit by 3 quarters of a unit in the x2 direction. And when you go up 3 quarters of a unit in the x2 direction, then the y's go up by 3 quarters times 4. That's another 3. So we can show that mathematically. What is actually happening?
Okay, five seconds left. Put in your guesses on the new question. Uh, I have 15 responses, okay. 17, at least uh, Let me go to present mode, present mode. Give me the present mode, okay. And 20 people in the new version where we have replaced the regression, instead of the beta hat one x1, we replace it with beta hat x1 times beta hat two x2. So a different type of regression and in this situation, this time, it really is the red arrow this time. So 13 people are right this time. So in this situation, it really is red arrow. So I won't hit reveal answer because of course the computer doesn't know that we changed the question, but the answer really is the red arrow. In this case, in this case, uh, beta hat one equals change in y when x1 goes to x1 plus 1 and x2 stays constant. Okay, and to really convince you of that, I have run it also in the simulation. So if we go back to where is the thing in the other tab, uh, here it is. So before I ran the regression with only x1, right? And the true model was 3.0, 4.0. And if you run the model, we, we said if you Simulate it with only an x1, you get 6, which is coming from 3 plus 3 quarters times 4. But here, if you run the regression with x1 and x2, so this hasn't changed at all. The true setup is still the same secret thing it was before. But now, when you estimate the model, beta hat 1 is now 3, and beta hat 2 is very close to 4. Uh, and so it really is now reflecting the truth. Beta hat 1 is how much you increase when x1 goes up by 1 and x2 stays fixed. And it really is reflecting that. So what is the moral of the story? The moral of the story, uh, the moral is uh, beta hat sub i means uh, change xi by one. So xi gets added by one and keep all others, keep all others, but only the stuff that's in the model, in the model, in model. Fixed. Allow stuff outside model to vary. Okay. So if you're outside of the model, then they're going to change. So as x1, xi changes, all many other variables in real life will change with it. And if those things are in the model, we keep them fixed. If they are not in the model, then we allow them to change. And I think this is the most important like, way people go wrong with linear regression, is they say, like, oh, I'm just going to like, run it with lots of different, uh, different I'm going to just put everything in it, and we'll, we'll just put it all in the coefficients. And then you get this like, horrendously big model where it's really hard, like the, the effect of each one is, is quite limited because it has these like, weird situations. Um, so I, I guess maybe even, even more high level than this moral, if you're only going to remember one thing, is that beta hat depends on what variables you chose on what variables you chose. There is no like true value of beta hat. There's only the estimated value in the context of what you did. And we saw that in this example, right? Depending on if you run a regression with both variables, beta hat one can be three or beta hat one can be six, right? So which is the true value? Well, it, there is no true value. It just depends on what the model you're running is. Um, so, okay, this is a, a very common misconception about how these linear regression things work. Any questions or comments about that? So the values can move around. They can change a lot depending on what you do. Um, 
So that's why when you're working on your project and you say, what was the coefficient you had in front of lot area? You know, if you ask somebody that, the answer they give you will not be informative unless they also tell you everything else they did, right? They say like, my coefficient was three, but I included this, 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 and this, and I didn't include that, 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 and that. Um, if you included a different set of things, you're gonna have a different coefficient. It doesn't mean that one of, them, one of you is wrong or right, but you just have two different values for the same coefficient. Okay. Uh, I wanna go back to mathematize. Give me, give me mathematize. Okay, uh, next question. So we saw the values can change. Here is a true or false on the same concept. True or false. So the coefficients can change, but can they change from positive to negative? So true or false. If the coefficient of beta hat one in the regression y equals beta hat one x is positive, then the coefficient beta hat one in the regression y equals beta hat one x one plus beta hat x two must also be positive. So we saw that they could change. It changed from six to three before. But can it change from positive to negative? Can it change so much that it goes from being like positive six to being like a negative number? Is that possible or not? Um, and so it's phrased as true or false. If it's positive, then the other one must also be positive. So you think it's always positive, positive, both true. If you think it could be positive and then switch to negative, then it pick false. And again, let's give you guys, say one minute, since there's only two options here. One minute uh, to try it on your own, and then we'll do a revote if people are split. So, can you think of a situation? Try to think of a like a real life example where it might change a lot. And in that example, could it change even from positive to negative? Okay, five seconds left, put in your guesses. We'll probably do a revote on this one too. Okay, let's take a look. What do people think? 16% of people think it's false. Five people think it is true. So if you select it false, that means you think it can change from positive to negative. It is possible to change from positive to negative. Pretty big majority on that. And that is the correct answer. It can change from positive to negative. So this is so shocking, right? To me, this is like, not, not only can the value change, but whether or not eating your vegetables helps you on your exam can change depending on what you control for, right? So maybe on days when I eat my vegetables, I'm feeling really good and I study a lot, right? And then we do the regression with only eating vegetables. We're like, oh, look at all the days you ate your vegetables. You did so well on the exam, right? But if you hold constant the amount of hours I studied, maybe eating vegetables actually hurts me on the exam. So, Vegetables on their own, the correlation is positive. Beta hat one is positive. But vegetables and studying, it turns out the vegetables are negative. And I came up with a simple example again to show this off uh, in the other window, which is this one? Okay. I think this one doesn't have anything else. Okay, great. So it must be this one. So these are all on the course GitHub um, for you guys to check out. Let's run all and see what happens. Okay, be careful. The person who wrote this is not trusted. Okay, uh, that was me. Okay, so here's the secret data. And what does it look like? There's again, there's an X1 and X2 and a Y. And here is the data where this thing works. There's X, this is X1 versus Y and it looks like this. And this is exactly one of these situations where whether or not increasing X1 does it help or hurt the Y? Does it increase or decrease the Y? And you know, this is a fun one. Let me, let me let you guys vote. Do you think increasing X1 will increase Y or decrease Y in this picture? What do you think it is? So, so it's, say, it's saying something about these coefficients and whether or not they're positive or negative, uh, if you want to interpret it more literally. And I made this a question for you so I can get your opinion. 
Let's get your opinion on this. So here's x1 and y. Does increasing x1 decrease or increase uh, y? Okay, and I'll do one minute. Just tell me what your gut instinct is. Okay, let's look. The quick poll from the class says, if you increase x1, what does it do to y? Most people think it's a negative change in y. Most people think it's a negative change in y. Here's what happens if you run the regression. So let's run the regression. Here's x1 and y, and here is a linear regression. Uh, okay, so here's some more stuff. But here is y versus x1. So here's a linear regression of y versus x1. And this is using the stats ordinary least squares model. I think this is the same one they do in the textbook. And they show you all this information, a ton of information. But the main thing you got to focus on is what are the coefficients of the intercept and the x1? And the coefficient is positive, 0 0.38. And if you draw a little picture of it, it looks like this. It's saying, okay, here is the data was the blue dots. The orange line is the fit. And we're saying if you increase x1, it's increasing y. So how, why is it that the uh, computer model says it's increasing, but most people said it's decreasing, right? Most people in the poll said it's the reverse. So there's something here. This one is, it's not that you guys are wrong, it's that you're interpreting the question in a different way than the specific way of doing the, the regression I just did. So you guys are, have the right answer to a slightly different question uh, than before. What, uh, what question did you guys actually answer? Why? Like, this is the correct answer for the right way of interpreting it. What is the right way to interpret, to interpret it? Or why did you, maybe just in general, why did you choose this? Why did you say negative change in y, decrease? Anyone want to say why they, why they picked it? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, I think your answer is correct because the data points are more towards the higher side, so it will go positive. Uh-huh. But uh, uh, what most of people, including me, thought yeah. was the trend of the points, like it is downward, the design. Right. But I think it is more like a logistic regression. It is a classification problem. Yeah, so it's got something to do. If you look at the data, there's obviously, to our human brains that are good at seeing objects, there is obviously two objects here. There's this blob, and there's that blob. Yeah. There's two blobs. Okay, right? And so there are two blobs. This is the two blobs problem. The two blobs problem. Doo -doo -doo -doo. Here's one blob going like this, and here's the other blob going like that. And this is, I think, the reason everybody chose decreasing, is if you draw a line in either blob, if you're a type one blob, then the X, you increase the x1, and the y values go down. So this is blob blob number one. Blob number one. Uh, x1 goes up and y goes down. Okay? In blob number one, if you are a blob one, the x1 increases, the y goes down. What happens if you're a blob number two? Blob number two. The x1 increases and the y goes down. And this is why all of you guys, or many people, picked decreasing. It makes perfect sense. Because you're thinking of the x1, the x1 maybe is like your height or your weight or something, but it's not your identity as a blob, right? The blob 1, you're either a blob 1 or a blob 2, and in either case, increasing x1 decreases your y. So this is why you guys all chose, or many people chose, decreasing. And really what you did, without thinking about it, is you said, change 
x1 keeping blob identity fixed. Identity fixed. That is what you guys all did. Um, and if you change x1 keeping blob identity fixed, what model are you actually running? It is not y equals beta hat 1 times x1. It's the model y equals beta hat 1 x1 plus, you know, like beta hat blob times which blob are you? So this is really, like, I think people's intuition is to do this kind of thing. You're thinking of changing x1 while keeping everything fixed. But when you run the regression y hat equals beta 1 hat x1 with nothing else, it's letting everything change. So what, this is not what the computer did. This is what you guys all did in your head. Without thinking about this stuff, you did this, which is perfectly reasonable. And what the computer did is it said, okay, we got two blobs. We got two blobs. And the best fit line is like this. And the reason the best fit line is like that is because as x1 increases, as x1 increases, you are more likely to be a blob 2. More likely to be blob 2. So as you increase the x1 value, there, when x1 increases by 1, we're more likely to see a blob 2 person than a blob 1 person. The blob 2 people have higher x1 values. So when you increase x1 and you also let the blob identity change accordingly, the whole y value increases because the blob 2s have higher y values. So this is the model, y equals beta hat 1 x1. And this beta hat 1, like we just talked about, this thing has an effect of both both the blob identity, the blob identity, and x1. They're both baked into the beta hat 1. So when you run this regression, you're combining which blob are you in with the effect of x1. And even though the effect of x1 on each blob is negative, the effect of which blob you are in is so positive that overall the trend is positive. So it switches from negative to positive here. Um, so that is a, uh, the example we're looking at. This, by the way, is called Simpson's Paradox. This is, if you haven't seen this before, it's, uh, I highly recommend you read this Wikipedia page that has lots of nice pictures that look a lot like the one we did. Here, here's the first picture they do, right? So they have two blobs, and the trend in each blob is positive, but the overall trend is negative because when you increase the x value, you are more likely to be in the red blob than the blue blob, and that is confounding things. And there's lots of real examples. You might think, oh, this is some kind of academic example. But is what, there was a famous case about did the university discriminate against women? So it was <laughs> accepting 44% of men and only 35% of women to the university. But then if you break it down by department, then it's pretty split. So in some, in some departments, the women were more admitted. And in some departments, the men were more admitted. But if you combine it all, it looks like discrimination. And it is, again, because each department had wildly different rates, so they were like different blobs. In department A, lots of people got in, but in department F, only 6 or 7% of people got in. So by combining things like this, blobs, you can change the, the trend line from positive to negative. So here's another, another example. And there's more like this. You know, There's some with baseball. Here's a really interesting one. Derek Jeter and David Justice, I guess, are baseball players. In 1995, David Justice had a better batting average. He was a better batter than De Derek Jeter. In 1996, David Justice was a better batter than Derek Jeter. He had a higher batting average. If you combine them, then Derek Jeter is better. So what? Wait, in 1995, I was better. In 1996, I was better. Overall, who was better? The other person, <laughs> right? It's very confusing if you've never seen this before, but it's, again, the exact same situation. There's two blobs. The trend in each blob is one way, but the overall trend amongst the blobs is the other way. So it has to do with the fact that both of them did quite a bit better in 1996 than 1995. So because 1996 was such a better year for both of them, and Derek Jeter went to bat 582 times in 1996. So 1996 was the better year for both of them. So even though Derek Jeter did worse in 1996, there were so many in that that if you look at, at the combined thing, then he's doing better overall. Um, so you can kind of explain this one. If you've never seen it before, I really recommend you try to get your head around this. It feels really crazy the first time you see it. Okay, so that's what we saw also with our blobs. This is a great time to stop for questions or comments about these blobs or anything. I'm gonna go through this notebook in a little more detail and we're gonna 
go through it. This is going to be related to uh, what you're going to do on the on the project, and then we'll we'll stop soon. Uh, questions or comments? Okay. So we have these two blobs uh, that we were working on. The next part. What's the, what is the next question? Yeah. Have you heard of Simpsons Paradox? Well, now you have. Okay. Let's. Uh, and then after that. Ah. Okay. You're right. I see where we're going. Okay. Don't answer this question yet. Let's. Can I? Can I stop this one? Pause. Okay. Um, so we're going to go through this example a little bit more, and this example means this example with the blobs. So if you do y and x1, the trend is positive. What happens if you do y and x2? So there's this other variable, x2, um, that's floating around. And if you look at x2, it looks like this. y versus x2. Is there a plot of y versus x2? Here is the plot of y versus x2. So same kind of thing. You can still see the two blobs. And for this one, the two blobs, there's almost like no trend amongst the blobs. The y is increasing as a function of x2. And you can see that if you do the regression, right? So the, re the coefficient is like 5. The, the x2 coefficient is like 5. And now this is the surprising thing. So let, let me summarize what we have with these blobs. Uh, if you do y equals beta hat 1 x1 with nothing else, then beta hat 1 is positive. Positive. And if you do y equals beta hat 2 of x2, then beta hat 2 is positive. Those are the two things we've seen so far. And now we're going to do the third regression where you combine them. And I'm very sorry that we're using the same variable names, which makes things very confusing, right? Like I have beta hat 1 written there and there, but they are two completely different numbers. Beta hat 2 is written there and there, but they are two completely different numbers. You just have to know which one I'm talking about, and that is the universe we're stuck in. So is beta hat 1, are they going to be positive or negative? And to do it, we run the model. We run the model, and you see that now it is negative. So it switched from positive to negative. So in this one, beta hat 1, the coefficient in front of x1 is negative, and the coefficient in front of x2 is even more positive. So now, now it has switched. Beta hat 1 is negative, negative, and beta hat 2 is positive. OK. So whether or not you're positive or negative depends on what you are sort of controlling for, what is in your model and what is outside of your model. OK. And uh, everything is quite significant here. So these values also tell you. Uh, whether or not zero is in the interval, right? They tell you the confidence interval. Um, so this is the confidence interval on one side, the confidence interval on the other side. And for example, x1, we're pretty sure, is between negative 0.95 and negative 0.6. So we're pretty confident that it's negative. It couldn't be zero within our confidence interval. And x2 is between 7 and 9. We're quite confident about that as well. And here is a picture of what it looks like. So I kind of drew this picture in an unconventional way. What I did is I took all the values. This is a plot of x1 versus y. So this is the plot where the slope was positive before. And what I did is I plotted all the possible x2 values. So I took all the x2 values that are in their typical range. And you can see that depending on the value of x2, you can get anything over in this, in this like parallelogram. So x1 on its own is not explaining what's going on here. And there now is a negative trend. As x1 increases, there's a negative trend. This thing is going down. And the difference between the two groups is explained by the value of x2. So presumably, the x2 value over here, they match this blob. And the x2 values over here match this blob. Same idea for the other way around, right? So as x2 increases, the uh, value increases. And depending on x1, you can either be at the top or bottom of sort of each blob. So it's harder to plot when you have two variables. Because you know you sort of have a two-dimensional screen, so if there's x1, x2, and y, you have to do something creative like this to try to understand what's going on. Here's another way to visualize it, and this is a really effective way to visualize things: is to plot the residuals. So these are the residuals. So what I have done is this is the original data in x1 versus y. Can I make this plot the way I want? Uh, maybe I have to do this. Yeah. Okay. All right. There we go. There we go. So this is x1 versus y, the very first plot you guys looked at. And there's the two blobs. And here I have plotted the residual as a little arrow. So this blue circles are our original data. And I draw a little line up. And that shows 
what we're predicting to be. So this blue line, the real answer was there, and we predicted it to be this triangle value, just above it. And you can see that we're doing quite well in the predictions. Like everything in this blob over here is predicted to be somewhere in this blob. Everything in that blob is predicted to be somewhere in that blob. So very good, uh, very nice, nice value. Um, and so you can see the effect of x2 is really making things like match the blobs nicely. By including x2 in our prediction, we've gone from something that was sort of nonsensical going across both blobs to something that makes sense within each blob. The x2 value is kind of acting as a proxy for which blob you are in. And you can see that over here. Here is x1 versus, uh, this is x1 versus y. And oh, here is a plot of the residuals. So this is the absolute, like just the value of the difference between the triangle and the circle. And the triangle, and the, the difference between the triangle and the circle looks like this. If you plot your residuals and they look like this, you're very happy. There is no pattern in this residual. These residuals look totally random to me. And when the residuals look totally random, that means that the difference that you have, the epsilon in your equation, really is a noise, right? The epsilon, we want it to be noise, and there's no signal we can extract out of this. If there's no signal we can extract out of this, we can be sort of confident that uh, this maybe is the irreducible noise of the problem. We're never going to be able to get better than this. We're doing pretty good. That's the residuals of x1 plotted against the residual y minus the predicted value. And it matches this, this little picture over here. Uh, questions or comments? I'm going to show you the same thing for x2. So here is x2. And I'm going to start with the pictures. Here is x2 versus the residual. So same idea as before. The uh, orange triangles, or the triangles, the blue triangles tell you the predicted value, and the blue circles tell you the real value. And you can see what they look like. So we're, again, we're still kind of in the two blobs. Um, but what does it look like as residuals? So it's hard to see the pattern here, but let me plot the residuals. That's the difference between the real value and the predicted value as a function of x2. Let's look at what that is. And do you guys see any? Patterns here, like it, this one really looked like no pattern. But this one, does this one have a pattern? Yes. Yeah, what's the pattern that you see? Um, as the x2 value is increasing, the y values are decreasing. Yes, okay, this is great. So, so, so technically speaking, if you look at everything all together, yeah. then there is no change. That's the definition of the residuals. They will always be mean zero. Because the residual, if it wasn't mean zero, you would have included it in part of your actual equation. So overall, there's no change. But what you said is absolutely true at a moral level, which is that if you look at this line right here, that as you increase x2 over here, this stuff is decreasing. And as you increase x2 over here, this stuff is decreasing. So there's a pattern. The pattern is not a, a global line pattern. It's like a piece by piece pattern. Okay. So this is great. When you see something like this in your residuals, that means there is some signal that my model did not see because my model was looking only at lines. And there's a signal there. Let's, th let's brainstorm. How can we include, how can we tell this information to the model? And we say, model, please look, there's the two blobs. You have to look, this one and this one. Please treat them as separate. How would you include that in the model? And you can do this with linear regression, again, by controlling which variables you feed in the linear regression, right? Does anyone know of a way we could include this information when we see a, something like this? to make our regression better, to improve our regression. Um, yeah? I know a concept, something like threshold. Uh, yeah, threshold? I remember from my bachelor's that uh -huh. there was some kind of a threshold value. Okay. So if a sample is below that threshold value of x2, yeah. then it will be in this class. And uh -huh. if it is above that, it will be in another class. Very nice. OK, this is a great. So this is one possible way you could do it is this is a totally legit way to do it. Um, and this is just treat them as two separate classes. Treat as two classes. So you, you define a class, and we're going to call the class of x. It's either going to be 1 if you're in blob 1, blob 1, or 2 if you're in blob 2. OK. And you said we're going to use a threshold value to decide. So this is what we would really like if you're in blob one or blob two. Of course, we don't actually know about these blobs. Like the blobs are just made up patterns on the screen. So I have no way to measure if you're in blob one or two. But what I can do is I can just look and I can just draw a line down the middle of the screen and say, if you're over there, then blob two. If you're over here, then blob one. 
So why don't I, instead of doing this, this is what I would like to do, why don't we do uh, the estimated class? We'll just estimate which class you are. And we will say your blob one if x2 is less than 0 0.5, and your blob two if x2 is bigger than 0 0.5. And I meant to write 0 0.5. So what we are doing is we are taking this thing and we are dividing it into two and we're saying just treat the points on the right and the points on the left as two separate classes. And then what do you want to do? Great starting idea. What did you want to do now? And then the line that we're yeah. talking about, we have to figure out a mathematical function that draws that line correctly. Uh huh. So I think it was something related to logistic regression. Oh, logistic regression. So logistic regression is a method to figure out, yeah, I, I totally know. Uh, logistic regression is a method to figure out this thing. Yeah. So if you knew there were two classes and you're like, I need a mathematical way to come up with the formula, you're in class one if this thing happens and you're in class two if this other thing happens. Logistic regression is a way to fill in this pink circle. And so it, if you didn't know this thing that we just said, then you would use logistic regression to figure this out. And then you would go from there. In our case, it's very simple. So we just did it by eyeballing it. We just said, Bang, down the middle, left and right. So we did the logistic regression part. Uh, and we are going to do logistic regression later in the course. Um, but we have the classification part. So now that you have this classification, this is an extra piece of information that you can feed into your machine. Whatever model you use, you can take this class and feed it in. One way you could do it is run two logistic regressions. Run two logistic regressions. Uh, and I, I, I did not mean to say the word logistic. Run two regressions. Pretend I did not say the word logistic there. Run two regressions. So you could just do like split your data into two. You do model one. Model one is everything in class one. And model two is everything in class two. And then you could just go back to this beta hat one. X one plus beta hat two X two. Beta hat one X one plus beta hat two X two. And just have two totally different ones. I guess you need to give them colors or numbers or something, so you don't mix them up. Let's call this model one in this color, and we'll give our coefficients a little one to remember it's from model one. And we'll give this one a little two in blue, and we'll, give, we'll do model two. So our coefficients will depend on model two. So you could just run your model two times, pretend you have two separate data sets. And then, you know, hopefully, because if they're really so different, then this is a great thing to do. Like if, if, if system one and system two are just com two completely separate things, then this is probably the best you can do. Treat them as different, really figure out which one is which, and do them differently. However, in this case, the two things are actually pretty similar, right? Like, it looks to me, like when we look at it, uh, let's go back to our original and very first plot. It looks to me like what is happening in this blob, the slope of this blob and the slope of that blob are similar. So it's not that they're completely unrelated. They're kind of the same, it's just that they're shifted, right? They're shifted up and down from each other. And if you're in a situation where they are related to each other, then it's better to not treat them as two separate models because by splitting it into two separate models, you have less data for each. So by keeping them together, you can have a bigger sample size and try to take the things that are in common between them and use that to get a really robust predictor and take the differences and include that on your own. So this is option one, is to run two separate models. Option two, option two, add a variable. So what if we do this as our model? We do beta 1 hat x1 plus beta hat 2 x2. That's what we were doing before. And when you run this thing, as you change beta 1 and beta 2, the whole like class thing is going to move around. But let's explicitly add on, let's put on beta hat class. And then we'll put on our class, our, our class label. Our class label. So we're going to add up Basically, we're adding a variable to our regression that is saying explicitly, are you in the left class or the right class? And when you do that, that means that these coefficients now are exactly what you guys all did originally. They're keeping the class fixed, right? When you estimate beta hat 1 and beta hat 2 now, we're keeping which class you're in, blob 1 or blob 2, fixed. Okay, of course, the problem with this class right now is like either 1 or 2. That's not what we want. So sometimes what people do is they do the indicator function. They say the indicator function of class equals two. And so this is the function, the indicator function. Let me, let me draw it really fancy. One of class equals two. This is uh, 
0 if class equals 1, and 1 if class equals 2. So this is called the indicator function. Maybe I should make it even more accurate. I can say is not equal to 2. So this is what they talked about in the videos of how do you convert variables that are discrete, how do you convert them to use in your equations for regression, and this is one way to do it. And if you look carefully at what this will do, this is the model, this is y is the model, then it's going to turn out that after some simplification, this is beta hat 1 x1 plus beta hat 2 x2 if class equals 1, and beta hat 2, uh, beta hat 1, same exact beta hat 1 x1 plus beta hat 2 of x2 plus beta hat class if class equals 2. So by including this thing in this way, we really have a split in our model where it will include an extra term if you're in class 2, and it will not if you're in class 1. And the great thing is, it is just literally at the level of doing the regression, we're just adding a variable. So we created a new variable trying to estimate which class you're in. We just throw that variable into the mix, and everything will work the way we think. And if you expand it out, it's doing exactly what we want. We have class 1 and class 2. Class 1 and class 2 are sharing the same beta hat 1 variable. They're sharing the same beta hat 2 variable, and there's just one thing that's added on for class 2. Let's see what this looks like, because this is exactly what was done in this notebook. So in the notebook, we, have, we saw this thing with the residuals, and we were like, oh, there's a pattern there. If I include which one is in or out, um, I can add a feature. And the feature I added, look, here it's called x3. And x3, I put it in brackets, x2 bigger than 0 0.5. So x, this will be 1 if x2 is bigger than 0 0.5, and it'll be 0 if x2 is less than 0 0.5. And I added it to my data frame. And now I have exactly the same setup as before, but instead of having x1 and x2, I have x1, x2, x3. It's exactly doing what we did before. And when you run the model, you get a nice picture like this. The program tells you, look, the x3s are either trues or falses. Um, so it's doing this thing of like an if statement automatically, and you can see what's going on, and everything is really nice, and you can make sure it's significant. Uh, I guess, oh, something changed here. Look, look at this. I said everything is nice and significant, because x3 is definitely significant, right? The, the confidence interval displayed here goes from 8.3 to 12. So somewhere between 8 and 12 definitely doesn't include 0. x1 is significant, goes from negative 1 to negative 0 0.8. So that is significant x2, which was significant before, x2 was a big positive number before, has gone from, not, from being very significant to being not significant. The confidence interval is negative 2.8 to 1. What happened? What happened? We included this new variable, and all of a sudden, what we had on x2 no longer matters. So like this coefficient in, in this model, this coefficient here, somehow it's like this thing is, we're really uncertain about it. We're not sure if it's positive or negative. Could be negative, could be positive. And what happened is that all of the information about x2 was somehow being taken care of by our class variable. So in the context of having this extra class variable, x2 no longer matters. x2 no, no longer matters. So that's what you should see here. You should see that uh, the other way you can look at the p-value, the p-value is really high. That means maybe this variable doesn't matter at all. And so by looking at this, you can say, uh, I think, did I run one more? Okay, so you could even run it again, and that's what I would do if I was really trying to get the best actual thing. I would run it again with only x1 and x3, and say, let's not even include x2. Uh, okay, and you can see the r squared is quite good now. It's been improving every time. Uh, now it's close to 90%, whereas I think originally it was a lot less. Okay, um, so what is the moral of the story is that you can add variables like this and this is something you will commonly do, especially if there are these categorical variables that can be classes. You will be doing a ton of that in the project with the housing, because there's all sorts of things like, does this house have a, a fence? Does this, does this uh, have a closed in backyard? And so you have to decide which of those are significant, which of them are correlated with the actual price of the house, and which ones don't matter. OK. Questions or comments? OK, I'll leave you guys with one last question. And here is the last, the last question of the day. Uh, which is this one. So uh, let me present it full screen. So I have an even better idea. We had this idea of dividing x2 into things that are bigger than a half, things that are less than a half, and it improved our scores. 
Here's my new idea. Let's make new variables for a lot of features. We'll make one called w. That's if you're between 0.1 and 0.2. We'll make one called uh, p. That's if you're between 0.2 and 0.3. And I'll just add in like hundreds and hundreds of variables. So every possible like little interval we can add in as a new feature. And when you do this, your model will improve a lot. I get a much higher R squared value. So I didn't actually run it. But you'll have to believe me. If I include more variables, I include more and more variables that have all sorts of things like is the x1 times the x2 bigger than 7? Is the x1 plus the x2 less than 5? Just all sorts of variables. I make a model with hundreds of variables and then I run it. I get a huge R squared value. I'm very happy. Look at how well I fit the data. What is the problem? And I'll leave you with that. So let's do two minutes of that and then this is what we're going to talk about next class. Uh, why can you not just add in as many variables as you want? Okay, 30 seconds left, put in a guess. What is the issue with just adding in a bunch of variables? Because you can always make as many variables as you want. Nobody's stopping you. Take a look. The issue is six people said overfitting. One person said overfitting will occur. That is absolutely what I would think is the problem. Remember, we don't want to fit the training data as best as possible, right? That is not our goal. Our goal is to fit the test data as best as possible. And if you fit the training one too well by adding in all sorts of like kooky variables that do all sorts of weird things and like you're just memorizing the training set. That's not what you want. You want to have a system that goes through the training set and uses it in the right way to extract the information that will generalize in general to the test set. And so adding in too many variables is a problem. The videos you're going to watch on Thursday's class are all about variable selection. And that is one of the major things you can do on your project is just of the thousand variables that are available to you, I think there's actually 80, pick the best ones, make a subset of them that is doing the best job that will do the underfitting, overfitting, and also give you like a nice final answer. Here are the best 10. I picked these 10, I get this score that's better than any other 10. Um, okay, so that's what we're gonna do next time. I'll stop there and I'll see you guys on uh, Thursday.